welcome to episode 55 of the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilson, and today we're going to be reconvening with Jeremy Robert Johnson for part two of our interview. If you missed part one, then just head back to episode 54, where we talk to Jeremy on Skullcrack City, the FBI, style over substance, and a lot more. So for now, let's get on with part two of our episode with Jeremy Robert Johnson. And now for a horror interview. What do you think are the best things that are happening in horror right now? Oh my goodness. Well, um, I think Adam Cesar... Is, which I'm probably pronouncing his last name wrong, but uh, I think he's starting to do some really incredible stuff. He's getting like a like video night, and um, I don't know who else is just ripping it right now. Cody Goodfellow, I think, is still doing amazing work. Although it, it lately it hasn't all been horror oriented. Like he did a Hawaiian crime novel called Repo Shark with a uh, Were Shark and. Uh, Gosh, who else? I don't know. I guess I've been reading a lot of crime lately. <laughs> I think that's been more uh, where my emphasis has been on my reading. Uh, uh, and then Nick Cutter's The Troop, I thought, was was totally outstanding. Yeah, definitely. Good shout. Yeah, I mean, I think, and we've said it before on the podcast, I do think there is a lot of crossover between crime and horror and actually quite a thin line. And... The example I always give is Steve Mosby and Gary McMahon in the UK, um, essentially writing very similar things, but Steve is marketed more towards the crime genre and Gary horror. So sometimes it's just the difference between which category your publisher decides to put you in. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. There was uh, this... uh group of people in Canada in the late eighties that called themselves Michael Slade. And they were like, a, a criminal lawyers or some kind of, they were just a cobbled together group of people writing these, uh, Royal Canadian mounted police, uh, procedurals where they were hunting down crazy serial killers and stuff. And they were just, they kind of felt like they were part of the splatter punk movement. And, but they were definitely, you know, primarily just police procedurals where people were hunting killers. And yet, Everybody I knew that was reading them was in the horror scene, and and they absolutely felt like these crazy horror novels. Um, and so I think anytime you have high conflict and you have you know life or death stakes and that kind of um, you know all those different elements that fit into dark fiction, the the line's really thin, and and then sometimes it almost feels like it's arbitrary where things end up marketed, you know. Like someone just makes the call or flips a coin or something and says, oh, this is this is crime or, or this is horror. When in reality, they kind of, you know, there's so many crime books that just, to me, read like straight up horror novels. And do you think because obviously there's a lot more people buying books online and a lot of people reading these different websites and listening to podcasts to get their recommendations, do you think that, genre labels are are slowly becoming more redundant as less people are going to bookstores to buy their books i think so i mean i you know i i wonder about the um whether or not those kind of genre tags in amazon make all that much of a difference you know i think the the new version of like the bookstore section on amazon is also bought a uh, little line, you know, that's under whatever book you're interested in, because then it's kind of saying these are the this is the section this book fits into. These are the other books uh, you might enjoy. So it does feel like it's you know more kind of tailored in a creepier way towards your actual inclinations um, versus you know when I was a kid, you'd just walk into the store and hope they had a horror section. If it didn't, you'd have to go to either literature or sci-fi or novelists. Then it was yeah, it was so specific. It was like okay you know, there's there's 14 books in this section. So this is what's available to me as a person who's interested in horror fiction versus online. It's just, you know, it's it's vast now, the amount of select, selection you have. So, yeah, I'd say that it's making the genre lines a lot squigglier as a, as a marketing tool. 
Well, you spoke about going into the sci-fi section, and I remember when I was growing up in the UK, there were quite a few bookstores that didn't really recognise the horror as a section to have in the store, so you would have to go looking in general fiction and sci-fi, fantasy, crime, just to, to find the horror and see where they've actually decided to file it under this time. I don't know if that was the same for you, Dan, or if that was similar for you, Jeremy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something we spoke about just before, Michael, wasn't it? I mean, you know, getting a Kindle to some extent kind of opens up so much more horror than, you know, you would be able to get conventionally in a bookstore or even to some extent be able to afford, you know, in terms of simply buying paperbacks, you know, it's, it's easier to, to expand your reading repertoire when you're paying $3 for a book as opposed to 15 for a paperback. You know, I think sometimes the price has a consideration in terms of accessibility as well. It, you know, you go in and there was the Dell and, and Bentham and Pocket and, you know, everyone had their kind of batch of horror novels out. And so it was a much, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say saturated market, but it was attain that stuff. And then there was a long kind of dry stretch where horror sections disappeared from stores or you went in and basically it was, you know, you had Stephen King, Dean Koontz and James Patterson, you know, was the, the closest you were going to get to a, a horror section in any grocery store, or, you know, small bookstore. And so um, there was a long stretch pre Kindle where I took to used bookstores just because they still had horror sections and they had all that stuff left over from the late eighties and, and early nineties. And so caught up on my back catalog that way. But uh, yeah, the Kindle thing is uh, it's been substantial for getting access also to a lot of old stuff, like what, uh, what dead eye press has done with all of Ed Lee's books, uh, which were, you know, hundreds of dollars to attain on eBay or, you know, via, private sellers on Amazon before they kind of put those things back out into the mass market as horror fans, which was pretty cool to watch happen. And in today's market, I mean, with the ever shifting landscape, how do you go about marketing your own work and then the work that you're putting out as a publisher? Oh man, if I had the answer to that, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be a pretty happy guy. I have no idea. I have no idea. I uh, just, you know, um, targeted flailing you know <laughs> getting out there and, uh saying here's where there's groups of people that that might be interested and then and then uh hoping you know amid the white noise and the the din of everybody else yelling by my book that there's something in, intriguing enough about yours or the, or the work you're publishing to to catch their interest um but that's that's a significant challenge you know and and uh, i i don't know anybody personally who can claim to have that answer you know i know a lot of people who their answer is is um work really hard for a really long time you know you look at brian Keane or carlton Melick the third you know you're looking at people that produce three to four books a year and that has really been their secret is just make it so there's so much of their work out there um that they can find an audience and that their audience has someone to attach to and they could trust them to keep producing work and to have a, a large catalog to read. I did feel that with Skullcrack City, there was quite a lot of buzz and quite a lot of noise that was made about it coming up to its release. And then obviously when it was released within the community. So that's why I asked the question, because I did feel that, you know, a lot of people were talking about it. But perhaps, as you say, it is a a result of hard work over the years and that's where the recognition and the buzz came from you know yeah i was i was really pleasantly surprised at um how skullcrack city launched um and i think the only thing we really did different with this title than other titles is is we tried to follow uh kind of a more traditional new york style marketing plan where you know we sent arcs of the book out to some of the bigger trades in advance and, um, you know, talked about it a little bit further in advance and tried to set up interviews and reviews uh, to all coalesce within, say, the first 90 days of the book coming out. And we'd never tried that before and, and found pretty positive results from it. But also just, I don't know, it took me nine years to make a novel. And, and thank goodness people were still interested and excited when it dropped. And, and uh the level of enthusiasm for it was really fun. And I also think part of it was just the 
the unpredictability of the book. Like people got into it and then they didn't want to spoil it, but they wanted to be excited about it. So all they could do was just post a picture of the cover, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that, and that, that added, I think an element that was maybe intriguing to people, but you know, claiming I, I understand how it worked would be, uh, would be false, you know? And it's been a few months now. So how are you finding as, as the book has been released, the reception and the sales that you're getting now? Um, we actually, yeah, we just did a, a big promotion uh, last week that actually we, you know, almost doubled the sales of the book in a four day period. So it was it was pretty crazy. Uh, but yeah, I just I, I couldn't be happier with the reception we've we've got for it. And it's been I think we're at almost precisely six months since it came out. And uh, I think we gave a lot of energy to it. And uh, yeah, I, I, I've honestly never had a book kind of take off like this. So we've been really, really excited and, and we're still anxious to kind of see where it, where it goes and if it continues to, uh, you know, build steam, but we've, I'm ready to stop posting about it <laughs> for the sake <laughs> of, uh, you know, other people that, that hang out with me on, uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, I remember last year when, uh, when Vandermeer's trilogy was blowing up and it was, you know, you you love Vandermeer and you're enthused for him, but you start seeing the book in your feed every single day and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. It's fantastic and it's out and, and we're all reading it, you know. Um, and then more recently, like, uh, you know, Head Full of Ghosts has had that kind of, kind of buzz behind it and it's so exciting at first and then when it keeps happening, you're like, okay, yeah, there's, there's a lot of books coming out, you know. Um, and so I just, I don't want to keep forcing people to look at, at Skullcrack. You know, I'm really excited about trying to produce some new work and then, and then hopefully the book takes on a life of its own. So, um, just as a human, like as a courtesy to the people around me, <laughs> I don't want to keep waving my book at them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It seems to be quite a difficult thing for writers to balance because obviously on one hand you want to keep spreading the word because every time you put a post out, particularly if it's somewhere like Twitter where it's public, you can be exposing your work to new audiences, but at the same time, you're aware that you do have a lot of friends and followers that are seeing it for the umpteenth time, so it can be difficult getting that balance. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's just, you know, with how with how saturated the media is with with advertising in general, you do feel like you're kind of a little bit adding to the pollution, you know, like uh, you know, just just adding to that sense of of commerce gone rampant and and product, you know, and it, it starts to feel a little less exciting, you know, at six months out versus when something first first launches. Um, but at the same time, it's it's cool when when people do still talk about your book or you know when you. Uh, have those kinds of opportunities or where something fun happens with with a story of yours so it is definitely a it's a tough balance to strike and and be courteous to the people in your life and and the world around you and still try to survive as a as an artist so people have worse problems you know than talking about their own books <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously so as you say i mean it is your livelihood and it is about surviving as an artist as you put it yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and so also, I, I think the other thing that, um, you know, I talked with David Osborne about this, and we both kind of agreed to, at finding some kind of ratio in your in your existence, whether it's in in the world around you or, or in online where you're you're human, you know, 75% of the time, you, you don't just, you're not just a, a spam bot for a book title, you know, because that's, that's the fastest way to become disinterested in, in uh, someone, even somebody you like online, as if they turn into a spam bot. So, um, you know, so I try to talk about the things that I'm passionate about on a daily basis, like my, my kid and, uh, you know, beer and yeah. horror movies. <laughs> it's got to be done. Um, i pace from the fiction for a minute, Jeremy. Um, I was intrigued by uh, when we were reading your bibliography, uh, your work talking about uh, the Mars Vault. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about that? Ah, that, can I just say that was something I wanted to talk about too. Yes! I'm a, a big, yes. big Mars Volta fan, so very interested to hear what you're going to say. Oh, yeah. Um, That was just a kind of like crazy serendipity where it turned out um, that I, I 
have a friend who runs a magazine called Verbicide, and he knew I was a super fan of the Mars Volta, and he had secured an interview with um, with Cedric back before their album Amputexture was about to come out. And so he said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd rather have somebody who really knows their work, you know, do the interview. Would you be interested? And I said, absolutely. That sounds amazing. And uh, then I got to do a phone interview with Cedric. But in the course of that, I discovered that, uh, you know, I mentioned, hey, you know, I dedicated my first book to you guys. And it turned out that he had actually, uh, when they were opening up for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he'd been reading Angel Dust Apocalypse, like on the tour bus. And so it just, and then my brain exploded and I had like a total fanboy moment and uh, thought that was super awesome. And then I didn't really hear from him. You know, the interview went well, it got published. And then it was almost a year later and I got an email from their uh, manager over at Universal saying, hey, you know, Cedric's interested in working on a project with you uh, for the launch of an upcoming novel. And then I, I kind of spent a week emailing all my friends to find out who was pranking me, who was messing with my head, you know. Um, <laughs> and then eventually, like, you know, I, I looked up the employee roster at Universal and found out this person supposedly actually worked there. And I said, OK, sure. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And and then I got to uh yeah, just uh, converse with Cedric for, you know, about a month uh, and then worked on this uh, kind of project telling the story behind their album. And he had this really bizarre narrative about a Ouija board uh, that, you know, the whole album was a concept album based on that. Um, and so he just wanted something that you could have pictured in the 70s, you know, being in a big gatefold, you know, album thing like the old Blue Note things where it was just a big write up about the album itself and its story. Um and so, yeah, he gave me a bunch of crazy stories and I constructed them into, you know, a kind of weird behind the music about them. And uh, it was it was super fun and, and he was great to work with. And I, I tried to get a book out of him, too. I wanted to, to publish him for Swallowdown, uh, but he'd gotten really into just drawing um, uh, kind of weird like Dilbert style cartoons about puppets and, and clansmen. It was <laughs> so it wasn't something I had the capability of properly publishing. Um, but yeah, and, uh, got to meet him and Omar and go to a concert of theirs down in San Francisco at New Year's and felt like a total, you know, groupie hanging out in the, the green room with them and drinking their free booze. And it was super fun. Yeah. And they were awesome to work with. And are you still in contact with them? Uh, on and off Omar, I, I only worked with for like one thing to clear, clear up the story. He's just, you know, he's making 12 albums a week and trying to direct movies and scoring things and all that. So, uh, but Cedric, I've remained in contact with, and he's just a super funny, nice guy, you know? And which other musicians and bands have affected you, uh, the most and why? Um, I think, uh, um, LP and Company Flow were huge influences on me as far as, you know, um, as far as hip hop goes. I listened to a lot of, uh, you know, Wu-Tang and Ghostface Killa when I was writing uh, Skullcrack City. Um, gosh, I mean, I when, when I'm writing, I use tons of different uh, musicians to just kind of shape the mood of, of what I'm trying to write. And so... Uh, like there were certain chapters in Skullcrack where I was trying to make sure the mood was a little less insane, a little less frenetic. So I listened to my uh, friend Christopher O'Reilly's piano covers of uh, Radiohead songs, things like that. Um, so just you know, all I, I I don't write without music, so that list is is uh, substantial. I actually make mixtapes for each specific project I'm working on. You know, sometimes a short story, I'll just put one song on loop over and over again for eight hours while I'm writing it to make sure I. I have that feel, you know, a certain tone to it. And then for novels, I make a, a, a mixtape, you know, that hopefully fits the mood that I'm going for with the book. So just the massive classic. amounts of music, actually. Yeah. The classic old school mixtape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I uh, actually I stole that from Irving Welsh. He talked about doing that uh, because he does uh, these books where he merges all these different characters, but they're so frequently in uh, first person. And so he said something that helped him maintain voice for each of the characters was to make a mixtape per character. And so he said sometimes if he was writing a terrible character, though, that meant listening to, to just awful music he couldn't stand, but he felt like it put them in their head, their headspace. Um, and so once I heard that, it's kind of kind of a method acting thing, but I, I think it also uh, 
is effective as far as putting you in a, a tone, you know, putting you in a kind of emotional headspace for what you're trying to do. And do you find good. that listening to music with lyrics can like alter the way in which you're writing or can affect it? Because I know that we've spoken to others who in fact can't listen to lyrics, but I mean, if you're listening to hip hop, that's obviously a fundamental part of it. Yeah, no, I, um, it has to be an album I've heard 20 times. You know, if I'm hearing it for the first time, it's it's too intrusive, you know, because you are you are listening in that really particular way and picking up what's being communicated. But, you know, with the Wu-Tang Clan, it's like, you know, I've been listening to that album since 1993 or whatever. So so to me, the words aren't even there anymore. It's just the sound and the, the feeling of it. But uh, every once in a while, I do go back into, you know, a story and find that I've, you know, accidentally inserted a piece of lyrics or or something that's clearly just you know a twist on on a lyric and then i have to cut that out because <laughs> it's you know if it happens subconsciously i still feel like okay i'm i'm biting a little bit that's you know i can't i can't actually insert that um but all you know if you kind of merge it in with a lot of instrumental stuff it, it isn't that intrusive but yeah if it's new yeah i i can't i can't listen and and write at the same time to music my brain hasn't heard over and over again no i agree i like sometimes at work i'll kind of put music on that i know really well just it's almost like white noise to block everything else out because you know it so well yeah it's it, like a, it's you know like a dissociative I mean? thing yeah yeah exactly yeah and i was just wondering you know we kind of what are your thoughts on that really michael so when i'm writing it has to be something that is either instrumental or where the vocals are quite obscure so there's quite a bit of like death and doom metal that I'll listen to, <laughs> which because <will>, <laughs> like it it can be so difficult to discern without really focusing on it, the specifics of the li- lyrics. Um, so I can put that on when I'm reading or when I'm writing. Um, I actually listened to a band called Cult of Luna while I was listening uh, while I was reading Skullcrack City, and it made it very very weird. <laughs> because <laughs> um, that's i mean the album that i was listening to it's called vertical it almost sounds like it could have been produced in hell it is a very bizarre uh album and then also things like dragged into sunlight so all these cheery names for for <laughs> bands are generally the ones i'm listening to but um couldn't really listen to Hip hop. I mean, there's quite a bit of hip hop that I'm enjoying at the moment, like Scroobius Pip and Sage Francis, Run the Jewels, but couldn't listen to it while writing or reading. It would just distract too much. Uh, but death metal or instrumental or kind of post rock, art rock, that kind of thing. Uh, perhaps the Mars Volta, that's probably as vocally accessible as we could go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it helps with the, with the metal. It's like even if you know what they're saying, it's the the vocals are so much more just a, a sonic element, you know. Yeah, so I mean, it's not as intrusive. I guess, like, I mean, so things like Cannibal Corpse, where it's very deep guttural vocals, I can put on, but then sometimes it's such a pummeling of the eardrums that that can affect what you're writing as well. <laughs> so there has to be some sort of balance. I mean, that's so unrelenting that there's no downtime. <laughs> so there we have it. <laughs> that put a, a stop to that conversation. <laughs> so we spoke before about what are the best things that are happening in horror right now. So conversely what are your pet hates and what are the things happening in horror that you wish weren't happening oh man i I don't want to be a negative nelly but (laughs) you know uh i i think just uh you know there's just a glut of boring horror fiction out there you know uh things that are just playing with the exact same elements in the exact same ways um that just just are these kind of mass produced like it's the idea of horror it, it doesn't convey the emotion of horror it's just here's a here's a big handful of horror elements that i typed up for you um 
and I, you know, and then there's there's just kind of like the Kindle glut. Uh, I'm really bored with post-apocalyptic Romero-esque zombie situations right now. Um, I'm really bored with attempts to do Ed Lee style, you know, splatter, extreme horror kind of stuff. Just because that doesn't, you know, speak to me. If it's not if it's not really carefully crafted, it it plays a bit uh, juvenile. I don't know. Um, so. I don't know. It, it's definitely a, a time where there's more boring horror available than ever before. But there's also like, you know, like I said, the troop before or bird box or, you know, there's there's other things that are that are feeling like they're observing horror, but then also trying to do something new with it or something really compelling or, you know, make you feel something. So uh, I mostly don't I, I don't have that much negative to say about it because it's I just kind of dismiss stuff like i'm like oh okay that exists but it, it's you know time is tight and it's it's not intriguing to me so i'm not going to spend too much time uh uh being concerned with it but uh i think just you know people saying oh it's it's some vampires and there's some werewolves and i throw them together so it's horrible, you know, and uh check it out I just I couldn't fall asleep faster i actually almost fell asleep in the middle of that description like <laughs> <laughs> And with time being such a premium, do you find that if you start reading a book and you're not enjoying it, you'll just put it down? Um, is there quite a process in terms of selecting what you will actually read to begin with? Yeah, I'll, I'll abandon a book now. I, I had a thing when I was a kid where I had this really bad uh, OCD thing where once I cracked a book and opened it up, especially if I'd paid for it, you know, I was going to read it from beginning to end just out of this weird sense of devotion to it, you know, and in almost no cases was I ever happy I had done that, you know, I'd make it to the end. I go, well, I did that, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd abandon a book pretty quick if I wasn't intrigued by it. But you can sample stuff so easily now, um, you know, and even when I was, when I was a kid, I'd, I'd read a couple chapters in store first before I'd pick something up or I'd just, you know, um, there's so many authors where you you're just trying to complete their their canon, you know, read everything they've got too. So you have your go-to authors, and then if it's somebody you don't know, you can sample it and find out if it if it might be worth your time. Um, and then the other thing I get is is you know um, people where I'm helping them with editing or you know manuscripts from other small presses and stuff uh, because that's a really you know actually really small community. So. I get to read a lot of stuff before it comes out too, which is, you know, um, actually kind of a blessing and exciting when it's people, you know, like Cody Goodfellow is one of my favorite authors and, and I get to read something he's working on, you know, a year before it comes out. So, uh, yeah, I have a pretty full reading roster where it stuff I don't want to read usually doesn't manage to intrude anymore. So when you're sampling a book, what are the biggest turn ons that will make you think, yeah, I'm going to stick with this and equally, what are the turn offs? I, I think the, you know, there's a confidence in, in the authorial voice that you get from a writer who you know is going to pull you in, you know, and you get that, if you get that past the first page, you know, if, if they didn't just use some cheap hook to pull you into the beginning, but it's really there at the, still, that feeling is still there at the end of the first chapter, you know, okay, this is, this is somebody who's capable and, and this is intriguing. Um, and then, you know, the other, if, if somebody's voice is just kind of leaden and dull, you can feel that right out of the gate too. Um, and so it's, it's pretty easy to say, okay, you know, I, I, I can't give this that much time because this, this just feels inert, you know, that's as vague as I could possibly make that answer. (laughs) So, so on the back of that, who would you recommend then? Who are your kind of, you know, who are you reading currently? Who would you recommend that our listeners go out and pick up that they may not have heard of before? Oh, I, you know, I have my, my set people. I always recommend just because they're, they're the people I, I try to read incessantly. So I would say, you know, um, Stephen Graham Jones, J. David Osborne, Laird Barron, Adam Cesar, um, Joe Lansdale. I mean, you're, you can always dive in with Joe as, you know, like I think he just had a, you know, a Western come out last week. Like there's always an entry point to, to check him out and, and what he's doing is always just expertly crafted. Um, and then beyond that, 
I don't know. Those are, those are the people right now that always, when I read their stuff, it gets me excited about the idea of writing. It gets me excited about what's happening uh, in horror fiction and in crime fiction. Um, so that's my kind of default answer. I think anything from uh, Craig David's or, you know, his alter ego, Nick Cutter, is is kind of an instant go. Because, again, there's a there's a guy where the voice is just, it's instantaneous for me. Like, the moment I start reading him, you feel like you're in the in the right place. And are there any writers that intimidate you? Oh, I mean, most everybody I just mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, you know, there's times in particular with um, with Cody Goodfellow where, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, like the Salieri to his his Amadeus, you know, like ah, oh, you know, no matter how hard I work. I'll never quite be able to craft something as immaculate as, as some of the work he does, uh, you know, as as full of creative energy and 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 the you know with that perfect kind of syntax and that perfect kind of narrative drive. So, um, the the author I spend the most time being jealous of their work would be Cody Goodfellow for sure. Okay, and for those who are looking for an introduction to your own work, where would you say they should start? Um. I, it depends on what they're looking for, but uh, you know, right now I feel like Skullcrack City does a lot of what I do as an author. It's definitely a, it's a unique thing. If somebody's looking for more serious kind of uh, uh, direct horror or literary stuff, I would say uh, my second collection, "We Live Inside You," is a good, really solid batch of uh, you know that kind of stuff. If they're looking for for a kind of darker uh, piece of work, and then if they're looking for something that's you know. A little more crazy and a little more fun. Um, the Skullcrack City is still the go-to, though. That's you know that's the new baby. That's like the thing you're. I'm excited about because it's it's shows off more of what I've learned as an author over time. You know, it's such a long gap between books, so I, I'm probably proudest of that. And before we go, what are you currently working on? What's next for you? And what aspirations do you have? So so hopefully three different novels. I'm uh uh. I've got a pitch out there for three different novels, and uh, I'm ready to write any of them. But uh, kind of one is sort of The Outsiders meets Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And another one is a uh, more traditional kind of post-apocalyptic um, story. And one is kind of World War II with parasites. So it's, uh, this historical document tracing uh, a parasite uprising so I've got a lot in the hopper right now, and I have a novella uh, that's uh, a bull sharks in South American rivers, which is a really kind of interesting, dark, weird thing. But um, so three about half years. That's that's my goal is to just uh, actually you stay in front of people this time and keep putting out new work, and that's that's a really broad aspiration for a guy who normally only produces a book every five years. So <laughs> I want to really increase my rate of production and, and, uh, I'm really loving just the, the act of writing right now and, and, uh, just getting, getting a lot more work out there and, uh, finding out what I can do in these kind of different forms. So. Sorry. What did you say? The aspiration was the, I, I heard the explanation behind it, but the actual aspiration. It oh, asp- it's just, to, just to write three novels and uh, a novella in the next two and a half years and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and get those out there. Yeah. Well, it's very pretty good going. With it. <laughs> it sounds insane, but usually I have to set uh, absurd goals just to reach like, you know, something regular. I have, <laughs> I have to stretch really far to, <laughs> to attain normalcy in a production schedule. So, well, it, this is what I've said before, and I think as well, if you set your goals so ridiculously high, then even if you fail to meet your goal, you're not really failing because you still, you know, achieve something pretty good. So, yeah, you know, I hope if, that's if legitimate. Fail, if, not you a... fail, if you fail to reach that, then maybe you've still got two novels out of it. Right, right. That's that's my that's my approach. That's my hope. It'll either totally work or I'll lose my mind. <laughs> you know, we'll see. <laughs> well, I'm sure we, whichever will be kept updated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and entertained. I'm not sure if, <laughs> if we should, though. <laughs> right at everything, you know. If I, if I did lose my mind, I would have to harvest. 
you know, and a lot of the the best authors and the most charismatic of people usually do. So it's a good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go, where can our listeners connect with you? Um, I, yeah, primarily uh, on Facebook, but I do have a. It's just uh, either swallowdownpress.com or jeremyrobertjohnson.com. It's my really creative name for my website. And uh, I have an email there and just kind of basic information about my books. And then uh, I periodically interact with Twitter, but I don't quite understand it yet. So I'm not over there that frequently. But, um, you know, like everybody else, I'm, I'm on Facebook and, and semi-active there. So that's usually my best point of uh, interaction. All right. Well, thank you so much awesome. for joining us today. And I apologize on behalf of Skype for their technical difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not on you guys. Yeah. Outstanding. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Nice one. Thanks, Jeremy. We appreciate right. it, mate. It was good fun. Yeah, me too. Take care. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes you'll be able to find the this is horror shop at this is horror.co.uk and also at this is horror.co.uk in the right hand navigation you can sign up for our this is horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything thank you for listening have a great day